show. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs, state fed, deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion, and this melt of pop. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. The No Miki Show. Hello, and welcome to the Nomi Key Show. It is Wednesday, May 11th, and I hope you guys have had a nice week. We had a little bit of a week off, got some good rest, ate some good food, hung out at home. Sometimes you just need to nurture yourself that way. Uh, but it was also a rough week. I don't know if I was necessarily resting or just getting into a fetal position. Um, definitely no pun intended there at all because of the state of the world. Now, I want to give you like a little bit of hope because sometimes we need a little bit of hope in these times and I don't want to do it in a delusional way. I think that this is obviously with extreme caution, being extremely cautiously optimistic. The The leak last week that occurred um, by, I believe, somebody on the right, but you know, who knows what will happen. Uh, it definitely shook the ground of many Democrats, many Democrats who you know, have been on the sidelines, hope for the best from the establishment. Many Democrats, part of the establishment, who have to work internally with other more conservative members. I think what it did was it revealed to many people in the Democratic Party who are still not on the progressive side just how hard we need to fight, how much we need to shift the system because we're completely beholden to a few folks in the party who, shocker, take a lot of money from similar interests of the Republican Party it's not necessarily that their districts are more conservative. It's that they take the same money. How we've been beholden to them, um, I think we know that, obviously. In, in the Senate, it's it's people like Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin. Uh, but there are others, of course. So I want to leave with you a little hope. A lot of people are saying now the Democrats might win in the midterms or it might be uh, – you know, a, a slim win because women are women and men are going to be motivated to turn out. And that might be the case. But I actually thought a couple days before – that might be the case for other reasons. And usually I am angry at the Democrats for, I don't know, not setting up operations across the country, having a 50 state strategy, having offices where people could just, you know, make phone calls for their local elected officials or their local candidates or a union hall. Now that stuff exists anymore. It used to exist when I was a kid. Democrats aren't into community building and 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 fighting off the right wing in these communities where let's not forget many of these laws have already passed um and they're now being used as grounds uh for what could potentially be Roe being overturned if the democrats had operations all over the country we may not be having this conversation i sure as hell think that we would be controlling more legislatures to start but maybe even some more congressional seats and possibly even a few more Senate seats. Because when you have a vibrant party in every corner of the country, you have people who are activated and engaged, who show up, know the message of the Democratic Party. Don't get confused between Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. That's That doesn't happen when Democrats are actually there. But, you know, that's an argument I've made a million times. So usually my thought is we don't win in midterms because we just basically cut off the lifeblood of the Democratic Party. Historically, at least in the last 40 years, since Democrats lost their 30-year reign over the House, let's remember that, that happened under Bill Clinton for the first time in 30 years. They lost the House. Since then, history has shown us that uh, a first-term president will lose uh, in the midterms. But history does change, as it did you know, when Bill Clinton lost the House uh, after 30 years. And I think in this situation, prior to this Roe decision, Biden was hinting at some policy decisions that might activate folks just because the conditions are so bad. One being reversing Title 42. Now, the insane Democrats that live in border states or don't live in border states think that they, they this is a great thing to campaign on, uh, who are against this, you know, they should be called out. It's, it's, it's shameful. Because this is a Stephen Miller design, and it doesn't mean that the border does not exist anymore. We know the reality. Uh, 
the, the Biden administration, I'm just going to guess, is still going to have some pretty abysmal policies, but maybe not as abysmal as Title 42, which is a racist, white supremacist designed tool that Stephen Miller, the racist white supremacist that was in the former White House, created uh, as an exemption to basically have more extreme inhumane conditions at the border when detaining uh, folks, migrants who are crossing. So there seems to be sense that the Biden administration might reverse that. And if that excites a few people to turn out at the polls, uh, especially in, in states, you know, especially in the, in the Latino community, the Latinx community, people, people who fought for him, who helped get him elected, who need to make sure that a state like Arizona stays engaged because they need to make sure that a Democrat keeps that Senate seat and that Kirsten Sinema gets primaried and we have a more progressive Democrat. So that is one community. Even if it's, you know, a sliver of who showed up in 2020, that might be part of the formula. And then the second community is anybody on this, <laughs> anybody in this country who has student loans, federal student loans. It seems as if Biden is hinting at some student debt relief. Now, I'm hoping for all of it because he has the power to do so with a pen and it really won't affect us at all. And the only Republican talking points out there are, well, you're going to teach people to not honor their debt. Let me tell you something. We've got debt everywhere, everywhere. You can't walk out of your apart. You can't wake up in the morning without having debt. So that, 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 that argument's not working. Student debt relief would not only make this economy better. And even for other debtors, which is a complicated situation, you have to pay your student debt first. You may not be paying your rent if, if you lose your job. Who wants you to pay your rent? Landlords. You know, you may not be paying your credit card bills. Now with interest, of course, that works for, for a period of time. But if there's no cash flow, suddenly even the credit card companies are upset. We are in a debtor's prison in this country. And of course, the more marginalized you are, the worse it is. So relieving student debt would be a huge policy decision that could activate so many Americans. I'm not even going to say young people because it's really a, a, a big chunk of this country that will stimulate the economy possibly before the election. So those two things, those two factors right there, those two policy moves could actually activate enough people as nothing the Republicans are throwing against Joe Biden is is clicking. They're trying to get him on Hunter Biden. It's not working. They're trying to get, you know, they, they try to go after him on Afghanistan. You know, everyone's talking about Ukraine now. And these are policy decisions that have deep consequences on people's lives, clearly. Um, these are humanitarian decisions and mistakes in some cases, but it's not clicking with the majority of Americans. And when you have an organized QAnon community out there in so many parts of this country, recruiting and engaging. You have a pipeline on the internet and you have Elon Musk now saying he's going to bring back Trump. Donald Trump has the power to sway this election because the margins were close enough in 2020. We're already, we already have a steep hill to climb. So Joe Biden really has to do more, and the Democrats have to do more. And especially with Roe now, people are going to be demanding it because we don't want to be in this situation again. We are not fighting your granddad's Republican Party. Just as racist, just a little bit more aggressive about tearing down the government. So it really is about putting everything out there at this point. The Democrats cannot do the status quo. We cannot wait any longer. We have a wonderful show today. Uh, we are going to be talking to Stephen Donziger, who is now out, out, free man. Uh, we're going to be talking about what what's next in his case. Uh, will he get his law license back? Is this the end? Are they going to still keep coming after him now that he's free? That'll be a really interesting conversation. And then we're going to talk to Don Guttenplan um, about his latest uh, stories over at The Nation. And, oh, of course, John Nichols. I almost forgot about John Nichols, of course. John Nichols is here today. We have a show. John Nichols is going to be talking about um, Jared Kushner's Sa Saudi – this is a tongue twister for me – Jared Kushner's Saudi side hustle and why it demands an inquiry, a full-on criminal inquiry. 
and he has a new book out too, which he's going to tease. And again, uh, with Don Gutenplan, we're going to be talking about the nation, the nation, not the nation that he works for, meaning the nation magazine, but the nation on drugs. All right, we'll be right back after this. the Nomi Key Show. All right. This is not really a surprise, but scary. Uh, I'm not surprised because I don't think anybody's surprised by uh, anything that came out of the Trump administration, the Trump family. But our dear friend uh, has covered this. Jared Kushner. Uh, They're not giving up on, on really taking on these guys. Jared Kushner uh, is, is a definite pal of the Saudi Arabian crown prince. That's a dangerous move, in my opinion. I'm just like, how do you get in business with these folks, man? But but our, our next guest, uh, John Nichols, has a piece out in The Nation right now discussing uh, Jared Kushner's Saudi side hustle that merits a full-on criminal in- investigation. Um, Elizabeth Warren, Senator Warren, has called in the DOJ to investigate uh, Trump's son-in-law. Hello, John. How you doing? I'm very good, Nomiki. It's good to see you. Nice to see you, too. Yeah. You have a different so- backdrop. I was, my, yeah, I guess it's a little different today. Um, but yours, I was going to say your lighting is really great. This, nope. is, yeah. this is, uh, <laughs> it's, mid, it's midday in Wisconsin. Midday in Wisconsin. So, John, um, I, uh, to get in business with the Saudi Arabian government, <laughs> you, you really got to be in trouble. No, like what's, what's, yeah. what's behind this? <laughs> well, let's put it in perspective. Um, Republicans, not all of them. I'm sure there's some that, 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 you know, are kind of put the lie to this theory, but generally Republicans are pretty bad at business. Um, (laughs) they, they are incompetent. They tend to, uh, rely on cronyism rather than entrepreneurship or actual talent or anything like that. And so there's a long history of these, uh, kind of, uh, inherited, powerful, uh, privileged young men who uh, don't do well in business, aren't good at what they do. And so they have to look further and further afield for investors. Famously, George W. Bush, uh, back in the you know early years of his business career, um, screwed up so frequently in Texas that Texas investors wouldn't touch him anymore. So then he went to out-of-town investors, people from other states. They invested with him. He failed so miserably that eventually started looking for European investors, right? And people in other places. Finally, he got to the Saudis, right? And uh, at a certain point, what you realize is that, that when the Saudis invest in you, when they put big money in you, they're not doing so because they think you're good at what you do. They're doing so because they want something. They want influence. And uh, if George W. Bush was a lousy businessman, you know, just somebody who's completely incompetent and ended up with the Saudis. Uh, You know, Jared Kushner is that on steroids. Jared Kushner has pretty much wrecked everything that he has ever touched. Uh, He is so bad at business that in New York City, where he operates, you know, people, they see him coming with his hand out there, they run screaming from the room, right? Mm -hmm. Because they know that if you invest with Jared Kushner, it's almost certain to go bad. Is and, that is that something that existed before the Trump era, or I mean, oh, how much yeah. of that is okay? Yeah, I mean, yeah. he used to oh. own the New York Observer. Um, yep. His his father is, was went to jail, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and it's why he's still mad at Chris Christie because uh, yeah. um, you know Chris Christie was the U.S. attorney that that effectively put uh, Kushner's dad in jail, um, and. Kushner's father, actually, by some accounts, was much, was relatively competent at business. Uh, and there are other Kushners that are relatively competent at business. They're not Republicans. But um, the... His brother, right? His brother's... Yeah, a, including. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, Why do but, I know so much about the Kushners? I know. Well, because they're so interesting. Uh, and But Jared Kushner, no, he's horrible at what he does. Uh, he 
he bought a big building in uh, in New York City with uh, I believe the address was six six six, and uh, and it went horribly awry to the point where you know he pretty much came close to wrecking his whole family's uh, you know wealth and privilege, and so you know look people don't like to invest money with the guy, so mm-hmm. fast forward to the current moment now that we have it in a bit of perspective, uh, when Jared Kushner served in the White House. He was the Saudis' point man. He was mm-hmm. there for them on anything that they needed. Uh, if a call was made, Jared, Jared Kushner responded to that call. And uh, if it was necessary to, you know, lie, cheat, steal, uh, deny a murder, uh, he would do it. Right? This was this was how Jared Kushner operated. When he came out of the White House, uh, of course, he needed to make money. Uh, all the people around Trump always need to make money. And so he set up a, you know, kind of a venture capital project. Of course, as you can imagine, nobody in their right mind in the United States would go near it. But um, the Saudi Arabians came through with $2 billion. Unbelievable. I know. $2 billion in, you know, just sort of like, hey, here's some money. Go for it. Right. Yeah. And uh, in that, when it, when it, was when it came through you thought wow that's that's pretty amazing amount of money but what's really amazing is when you look at the rest of the investments in kushner's this this fund that he's set up there aren't any there's virtually nothing wow almost no one else has put money into it so effectively what you've got is a situation where a guy served for four years in the white house doing the bidding of the saudis at every turn and when he comes out of the white house he sets up a vehicle that the Saudis put two billion dollars into, right? Mm-hmm. Effectively, you know, making it a reality that it would not have been otherwise. Now, this is such an obvious quid pro quo. It's such an mm-hmm. easy uh, argument to make because, literally, Kushner is so incompetent that um, it merits investigation. It merits inquiry. You have to say, you know, why did this happen? And if it did happen. Because Kushner had served Saudi interests while he was in the White House, then you have a flat out scorching scandal that ought to be investigated at the, at the most fundamental level by the Congress, by the courts. But then, you know, you'd say, oh, but how can we, you know, how can we confirm that? You know, how can we get to the heart of the matter? Well, as it happens, the, the Saudi fund that invested with Kushner has experts. They have professionals who come in and analyze requests mm-hmm. for their money because no surprise, people are always asking for Saudi money, right? They, you know, give me a billion, give me a couple billion. I want to do something. And so they actually brought in a team of people to analyze the, the proposals. The analysis of the proposal from Jared Kushner said he's got no track record in this kind of investment. He's not good at it. Wow. It's not a reliable investment. This is not a good idea. So we actually have the paperwork that says this shouldn't have happened. And yet it did happen. And so at this point, if it doesn't get an inquiry, if we don't look seriously at it, then effectively what we're saying is there's nothing that happened during the Trump presidency that is going to face any kind of scrutiny or any kind of accountability. Because this is this is really the the kind of, you know, the flashing red light. This is the lowest hanging fruit. This is the easiest target. And. You know, it astounds me that Democrats haven't, you know, rushed to do more on it. I'm not astounded, but um, I know. I've seen more. Yeah. So, so is this is this how is this different than say the Chinese buying the White House in the '90s? You know, oh, look, it's not so different. You okay. know, I mean, it's some fundamental level. I think I think we recognize that there's a money in politics reality that that goes deep in our in our system we don't you know it, it, carl rove's hero was william mckinley and the people around him because mckinley was the, the last really effective corrupt president and you know i mean <laughs> they, really they, amazing. they literally celebrated i mean no rove wrote a book about this he's he's like he loves these guys because they were so you know like meticulously crooked in how they did it and and so the bottom line is that uh we've always had this in our politics and we have had it in both parties there is mm-hmm. simply no question that that you know this is this is it, certainly anybody who's 
we had looked at the Chicago machine in the in its so-called glory days knows that this is this is nothing new. But um, it's now writ large across our politics in a, in a much more fundamental way, because, mm-hmm. frankly, the the bad players of the past were petty crooks, you yeah. know, by comparison to what we're seeing now. You know, I mean, Spiro Agnew got tossed out of the vice presidency for taking, you know, like some cash in an envelope from some road contractors. I mean, this is that's that's low level stuff. I mean, it's yeah. bad, but it's low level. What we're dealing in now is billions of dollars. And it it I do think that what happens is that because both parties are so in league with Wall Street, the investment bankers, uh, the billionaire class, that they don't like to, in fact, they may not even imagine that when you get to that level of money, that kind of money, that it can be corrupt. Mm-hmm. I know it seems absurd, right? They would it's certainly- just so systemic. Right. It point. is. It yeah. is sort of like, well, this is how it works. And and so I do think that there are Democrats who, um, frankly, are, are cautious about this because they think, well, you know, we really don't want to open up that can of worms. But the fact is, it's exactly the can of worms that needs to be opened up. And if I can just, you know, extend it, if you want to take a, a, a story of the moment, right, mm-hmm. that relates to this. Um, Jared Kushner is obviously in trouble. We're talking about him. We're also talking of late. There's been a lot of discussion about John McCain and mm-hmm. uh, Steve oh, Schmidt, the former McCain. Oh, boy. I, that was so much fun to read this weekend. I know. <laughs> yeah, I, in case of anyone tuned in, and I know you have the most politically informed people around, so we don't have to explain it too much, but Steve Schmidt, the former McCain campaign aide, sort of let loose. And he said, a lot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and what he, and I have a big piece up on the nation website today about it. And, and what he said was, look, there were people running the McCain campaign who were in the service of Russian oligarchs. And it, in fact, set up meetings between McCain and Russian oligarchs. Now McCain himself was a little resistant to it. Give him credit for that. But the fact of the matter is, this shows how systemic it is, and also the fact that um, when you look at, at you know, Russian oligarchs having influence in the Republican Party, it started long before Donald Trump showed up. Mm-hmm. And then you ask yourself, well, how did that happen? Well, it happened because of money in politics right. and because of the ugliest play out of money in politics, which is not the money spent on campaigns. Oh, that could warp campaigns and make them awful. It's it's the intersection of campaign strategists and lobbyists. And yes. so what you have is a situation where campaign strategists, you know, they kind of like, you know, every four years they run a presidential campaign. What they do the rest of the time is the really crooked stuff. Mm-hmm. They lobby and, and increasingly they lobby for whoever around the world has the biggest pile of money. So Paul Manafort, Rick Davis, people who were literally, you know, Davis, especially managing the McCain campaign, Manafort, who was chairing, you know, chaired the Dole campaign, influenced the McCain and Bush campaigns, uh, chaired the Trump campaign. You know, do you see a pattern here? Right. Mm -hmm. This is a guy who literally went to jail for his ties to the Russian oligarchs, his efforts to influence campaigns and and then got pardoned by Trump. Right. No accountability. And so when we start to understand this. Uh, the revelations about Jared Kushner, what we just hear, you know, with Steve Schmidt and all these folks, what I can point to any day of the week, any day of the week, a scandal. You can almost always trace that scandal back to the willingness of the consultant class, the right. strategist class for both parties That's right. to lobby for the worst players in the world and then to intersect that lobbying with their political service, i.e., as happened with Schmidt, to get a uh, dinner for John McCain outside of Davos in Switzerland with the guy who is referred to as Putin's favorite oligarch. A guy who, by the way, is still is still Putin's favorite oligarch. Putin's favorite oligarch. So, so, so that's interesting because I'm I'm also thinking on the Democratic side, like how does this look sometimes? You know, um, I, I assume folks are familiar that Saudi Arabia. Israel, uh, Russia, Russian oligarchs have invested in a lot of tech companies, uh, whether it's early investors at Facebook, Russian oligarchs, or Saudi Arabian. Uh, I, I, the prince is investing in a lot of tech companies. Oh. I'm not even sure what the list is. Um, 
But, you know, there are people who are former White House officials that are now lobbyists or executives Absolutely. at these tech companies like, you know, David Pluff. And I think he was over. I don't know if he's still at Uber, but he was at Uber. I mean, this is it is so it's not even just lobbying anymore. It's like so for Jared Kushner, Kushner it's an investment fund mm -hmm. for um, these other White House officials. It's it's the tech companies or other what's I don't know what the next company is that they find a way to launder their money in through influence mm -hmm. in a really like backdoor way that's not as in your face as you know just just taking the money. Sure. Well but, crypto's on the move crypto's yeah. on the move crypto right now and hiring all over the place. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So I, I have a question just in the geopolitical sense of how does Jared Kushner's you know where I'm going here. How does his politics when it comes to Israel line up with his politics and relationships with Saudi Arabia? I, I, I'm I really confused about what these people are getting and at what times and who their allegiances are really for. Yeah, well, to. you're asking me a really painful question. About, you know, how do you how do you get inside Jared Kushner's head? <laughs> Right. And it's like heaven knows what's going on in there. It's it's ugly to be sure. Um, but look, there is a long history of uh, political players who are who announce their their great solidarity with Israel and mm -hmm. yet who also do business with uh, Saudi Arabia. And the Saudis know about this. They, they understand this dynamic. The Israelis understand this dynamic. It's a very interesting reality that um, you see these places where money trumps everything. And, uh, and I think that, that, you know, for Kushner, it becomes an especially fascinating reality. Because remember, and I know this is, this is so absurd. It's, it's like, you know, I mean, I can't even imagine a, a, a comparison to, that, would, that would sum up the absurdity of it. But Jared Kushner was in charge of trying to achieve Middle East peace. Yes, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's yeah, just... that's what I'm telling you. And so, um, you know, you're like, okay, well, that's there. There you go. He certainly knows the players, um, or at least he he made an attempt to. Uh, newsflash: He didn't succeed in that. He mm -hmm. failed in everything he's ever done, including achieving Middle East peace. But in that in that setting, uh, the question that you have to ask yourself is: Was Jared Kushner when he was in the White House? interested in achieving Middle East peace or in maintaining a Middle East status quo. Mm -hmm. And this is becomes a, 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 an interesting dynamic here because if you really are looking for peace in the Middle East, you also have to look for a measure of economic justice, right? Mm -hmm. A measure right. of equity in you know a number of countries and for people who have, the great mass of people who have been historically dispossessed. Right. Be they Palestinians, be they, you know, the great mass of Egyptians. You can run down the list of folks who uh, either live in in sovereign states or in uh, contested territories, whatever you want to say, however you want to describe it. If you go across the Middle East. There's a great deal of economic injustice. We understand that um, if you want to get toward a an equity. Right. As regard that might lead to peace. Right. And that might lead to much more cooperation. And I've reported a lot in Israel, Palestine, Jordan, other parts of the Middle East. I can tell you that there are people on the ground, uh, Israeli peace activists, Palestinian activists who can point you to solutions that could work. Right. Mm -hmm. And say, you know, this this could this could actually happen. And same in Lebanon, same in other places. But what happens, what, what ends up happening too frequently is the power players in the region, uh, including the Saudis, they prefer a circumstance where they are, there is there is a tension there, right? And they get, what do they get out of it? Well, they get massive U.S. military aid and, you know, sweetheart deals to for the Saudis to buy, you know, all sorts of military equipment, which they then use against Yemen, you know, one of the right. poorest countries in the world. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, obviously Israel and Egypt both get massive U.S. Uh, military aid and also economic aid of all sorts of other sort of kinds. So you end up in this situation where there's a status quo that is very, very comfortable for the elites, right, mm -hmm. or the, for the very, very wealthy. Um, it's quite horrific for, for a lot of other folks. 
But I think when you have someone like Jared Kushner, he comes in and he only moves in that elite circle. He doesn't begin to consult with or talk with people I've met uh, who are sincerely trying to achieve peace. And, and I cannot begin to, to tell you what a difficult and frustrating task it is for Israeli peace activists and for Palestinian peace activists who really do talk to each other, seek to get someplace, and they just don't have buy-in from uh, the powerful forces in the world, including those in the United States. And that's something to we circle around to Jared Kushner because, uh, you know, look, there's a lot of arguments that, you know, in the Trump presidency that for a variety of reasons you could have gotten toward peace. You could have moved in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, the, every evidence is they moved in the wrong direction. And you say, well, who benefits by this? And I would suggest those who seek to maintain a Middle East status quo benefit uh, a great deal. And, and Jared Kushner, uh, despite all of his pronouncements, uh, ended up maintaining a, a very bad Middle East status quo and one where he is now $2 billion ahead. Jeez. Jeez. So, so what happens next? I mean, uh, Elizabeth Warren's calling for these investigations. Um, yeah. Um, well, if, if uh, past is a uh, pretext, you know, or, or past, if past gives us any indication of, of where we're headed, nothing. Um, and I hate to say it. Meaning, meaning like she can't, she won't have enough. Like right. what, what does she have to she do? She wants to, to do it. Look, there's yeah. simply no question. And there are other, in fact, I, I give Elizabeth Warren immense credit on a host of issues. Uh, if there is a chance to step up and, and, you know, try and make something happen, uh, she does. And, and she uses her own voice. She uses whatever influence she has. I've covered her for quite a while. I, I, I think she's genuinely sincere in this. And I think she has allies, but there are some other members of Congress that are sincere. But uh, the notion at this point, look, there's another way to say it. Let me, let's, let's pause and go back and, and say, what haven't they investigated? What haven't they gotten to the bottom of, you know? Well, you can say Jared Kushner, that's a good place to begin. It's certainly, it's a fabulous story. It's a great one, easy one, probably, right? But then that opens up uh, all sorts of other deals, right? You can right. just see, that's you know, if there's a, a Senate committee and Josh Hawley's on it and he's going, yeah, but what about the Democrats who- Exactly. Don't? Exactly. And, um, and, but then you keep going down the list. I mean, investigations and accountability simply are not a part of the Biden administration at this point. Mm -hmm. And it's a really frustrating reality. We're around the time of looking at 1 million Americans who died as a result of COVID. And that's a low figure. You know, right. we're looking at tens of millions around the world. We're looking at uh, uh, tens of millions of people in the US who got sick, uh, some with lingering COVID. We look at hundreds of millions of Americans whose economic and social lives were affected. We have a mental health crisis in the country that relates to, you know, the isolation, the other challenges. I mean, pretty bad situation. And we know that Donald Trump and the people around him deliberately lied mm -hmm. and deliberately failed to take the basic steps as regards labor protections, as regards transportation protections, all sorts of other things that they could have done. That's merits and inquiry. <laughs> but what, what, what's so bizarre to me is they've they've been able to do what what is the ultimate like you know don't do it to us because we'll do it to you move which is impeach Trump twice and yet they can't do an inquiry I mean is David Pluff more important like okay fine so so there are Democrats who do this too I'm not saying David Pluff because I, I you know that's not as direct but like you know there are Democrats who do this too but they're not that important <laughs> like well, they you're gonna be kill that. your they party be, they shouldn't be that. a few consultants that that yeah. you know whatever they're interchangeable it's not like you can't find another one who didn't take money from saudi arabia or or, or china because if you set the standard then this is this is what happens uh, i i think it is uh a risk in the eyes of democrats because they have lost the accountability muscle right mm. they literally it, it doesn't even make sense to them they don't understand. I've actually had top Democrats say to me, oh, uh, you know, we can't really focus on accountability. We've got to focus on bread and butter issues. Right. They always say that. Well, they're not doing that either. They haven't done the basics. And so 
when they say that, you know, they're not being honest, right? I mean, it's, it's what they're really saying is we don't want to go down that avenue. We don't want to go down the avenue of looking at accountability and, and doing it in a serious way because I, I think it's much more than just losing a consultant. It's losing a, a sort of a way of life politically. This, this idea that politics must always be cautious and centrist and we're better than the other guy. That's how the Democratic Party has operated now for decades is we're not great. You don't have to love us, but we're not as bad as those guys. That's that's basically their official slogan. Well, the end result is that um, you have a dynamic Republican Party. Uh, its dynamism is in exactly the wrong direction. It's horrific uh, and wrongheaded, anti-democratic, et cetera, et cetera. But it's it's very electrified, right? It's, it's energetic. Uh, it, it's always on the march. It's always on the attack. And then you have a Democratic Party that says, well, you know, uh, we can't do much, but if you give us power, uh, we won't do as bad stuff Republicans would do. So why don't you just uh, give us power and let nothing change, right? And they've gotten so used to that way of doing politics that, and it has worked for them sometimes, to be honest, it, uh, over the years. It's been of, of some value over the years at, at, at some times. But, but the end result is, that, to my mind, uh, that they have now set themselves up for a situation where because of their avoidance of a focus on accountability, they run the very real risk of, of losing in ways from which they will never come back. And so the old balance that they imagined, right? It, we don't do a lot, but then the Republicans will come to power. They'll do such horrible things that then power will be given back to us, right? Right. So- we won't do a lot of, that's good for the, the great mass of Americans uh, as, in fact, we'll do a lot for Wall Street, the Clinton administration example, exactly. right? Then, you know, Bush comes to power. Bush does, you know, the war in Iraq crashes the global economy, gives let's gives Cheney free reign to kind of wreck everything. And the Democrats get power back, right? Mm-hmm. And then will lose it again, et cetera, et cetera. This, this sort of back and forth. And I think they've actually gotten remarkably comfortable with that. Yes. You know, a lot of the, the elites of the Democratic Party. Well, now we're in a situation where, you know, they literally tried a coup the last time, the Republicans. <laughs> I mean, they, 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 they're getting pretty far out there. And to my mind, what this administration should have been about, you know, the, the Biden administration should have been about, A, easing the pain of the American people. That's first and foremost responsibility. But B, accountability. And these things do not detract from one another. The fact is that accountability drives policy. It makes it easier to do big, bold things. Franklin Roosevelt understood that when Wall Street was against him, when the bankers were against him. He said, I welcome their hatred. Now, Roosevelt knew exactly what he was doing. He was saying, yeah, I I want to be at odds with those guys. I, I want I want this to be a fight because if there's a fight, people have to choose sides. If they choose sides, I think they're going to, the great mass of Americans are going to choose the side of the new deal and of a project mm-hmm. that seeks to put people back to work, to build things, to do rural electrification. It may be imperfect, but at least it's trying. And I, I think the problem for the Democrats is they came in, they said, well, we want to do a new, new deal, right? But what they didn't remember was that what powered the new deal was an accountability instinct, holding right bankers and wealthy people to account for what happened during the Great Depression, holding war profiteers to account. During World mm-hmm. War II, the United States had an over 90 percent tax on corporations that were making more during the war than they had been before. 90 percent tax. That's they had a 95 percent tax on on the wealthiest people uh, if they if their investments were, you know, reaping. Mm-hmm bigger gains than before the war, you'd be taxed as high as 95%. The end result was that people knew which side they were on. At this point, I think a failure to focus on accountability has put the Democrats in a situation where um, I think a tremendous number of people don't know which side the, the party that they put in power is on. They have a full sense. Now, the debate about abortion, which is very vital, may influence that and may give the Democrats some traction right. that they lack. There are some other factors that may make this less of a blowout than than some fear. I, I'm in the camp that says there's still plenty of room for the Democrats to to make a play uh, and perhaps to be 
far more effective in this midterm than than some anticipate. But right. it, it wouldn't be this hard. It wouldn't be this difficult. It shouldn't be this hard. <laughs> exactly. If there had been a focus on accountability. If John Nichols was running the Democratic Party and I was his ah. vice chair, we would be in great, yeah, clean up. It would be a very we, different thing. We, we know that we could talk about the consulting class in the DNC for, for hours, but uh, that was the hardest thing was, was ridding out those conflicts of interest. And that's when they went hard and, and, uh, and nasty and, and smear tactics and all the things that they do in their playbook, uh, because that's their bread and butter. That's, that's literally it. Um, John, uh, you have a new book out right now uh, that I would love to have you back on to discuss soon. Uh, it's called Coronavirus Criminals and Pandemic Profiteers, something you just sort of tipped off. Uh, who made money during the pandemic and why? And, oh, it's just such a great, you know, opportunity for for so many wealthy people <laughs> to take advantage of, of crises that's and the, death. You'll notice that Jared Kushner, Jared Kushner is on the cover. Jared Kushner, Trump, and Bezos. Yeah, yeah. You forgot about and, Elon Musk, though. Oh, you know, it's it's it it's hard to keep up with it. Musk does figure <laughs> in the book. I will I will tell you, and um and and I will talk about it at some other time. So I won't belabor it at any great level. But I will give you one nice factoid, which is that uh, during a pandemic where we were told we were all in it together, mm. uh, where a million Americans died, tens of millions got sick. Hundreds of millions went through economic turbulence and, and social challenges. Uh, the billionaire class, the the you know roughly 700 American billionaires, increased their wealth from three trillion dollars to five trillion. Oh, well, I feel like they could have gone double. I know. It, well, the good news for the billionaire class is that while you suggest they could have made even more, um, they they during the course of the pandemic, at a time when we were you know, literally seeing essential workers suffer and die. Uh, to try and, and help the, the whole of humanity, uh, there opened up a discussion in the financial press about who would be the first trillionaire in America. Would it be oh. uh, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk? And at the time, at that time, that was when they were both flying into outer space with their their you know, you know space rockets. projects. And so the thing to understand is uh, that there is no opening that the billionaire class won't take to enrich itself. And that sort of ties everything we've talked about today together. The fact of the matter is that uh, when members of the billionaire class enter into so-called public service, they do not serve the public. They serve their own interests and that of the people who might invest $2 billion with them. Mm -hmm. And when they are supposed to protect us from diseases, they don't protect us from diseases. They lie to us. They fail to do the basics because uh, at the end of the day, they think somehow in some political calculus that will be better for them. And ultimately, um, when pharmaceutical companies and other interests uh, are called into the public service, they first off say, how much is in it for us? And so the fact of the matter is, the only people who really were all in it together was the working class. And the working class suffered the most during the pandemic, and that's what I write about in the book. John, we'll have you back on to discuss the book. Go check out uh, John in the Nation. He has a story about Jared Kushner's Saudi Arabia uh, scam uh, side hustle, I guess you could say. Very, very $2 billion side hustle. I wish I had side hustles that brought that money, but didn't you know sell my soul out, I guess. Um, and of course, the new book out right now. Go check out John Nichols. Thank you for joining us, John. It's an honor to be with you, Nomi. As always. All right, we'll be right back with the one and only Stephen Donziger. Stephen Donziger, we have been following his case uh, for pretty much the entirety of the show since we launched. Uh, Stephen, of course, was <laughs> tried and convicted on totally fabricated false charges. He's a, a human rights attorney and a writer. And of course, he was an attorney on the team that won that historic judgment against Chevron. Uh, he was 
actually put in prison, as we covered, and uh, most recently served the rest of his prison sentence from home. This is after he was under house arrest for two years. Stephen is now out and about <laughs> and living his life. Hi, Stephen. Welcome back to the Nomikisha. How does it feel to be free? And why are you inside? Why aren't you doing this from a park or something? <laughs> <laughs> Because I need internet access. <laughs> that's um, true. That's true. <laughs> no, it's it's it feels great to be free uh, after 993 days of detention. It's really hard to stay home. <laughs> like every time I come here, and this is where I work, you know, it's like, why am I here? Like I don't have to be here anymore. So you know, we've been going out and celebrating and just experiencing the city, and um, you know, it's 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 the physical thing being able to get out of here and do you know, what you want when you want to do it. And it's also psychological in the sense that like you're free in your own head. You know, you don't have to worry about trying to get that ankle bracelet off every day. I mean, literally I was so looking back on my detention. I think I was so stressed out. I mean, every day I'd wake up, I'd make a list of stuff I needed to do that day and started with like lawyers and what's our next move to get the ankle bracelet off. Um, and, and it just was a seven day a week, anxiety that I had, even though I was able to, I think, deal with it effectively, it, it just never left. So to have that lifted um, and to sort of try to begin to get my full life back is just an extraordinarily exhilarating <laughs> experience. I mean, I'm living this intense period of time where like I'm tasting freedom like it's never tasted before. Mm -hmm. And at some point it's going to end and things will probably feel like they were before, maybe a few weeks, maybe a few days. I don't know. Like right now I'm in this feeling that's pretty wild. I mean, and, and, and it's springtime, and there's so many different factors here, too. This is New York is sort of coming to life again, uh, where you live in New York, uh, because it's spring, because even though COVID is still on the rise, uh, we're not reporting numbers anymore, so the government thinks the pandemic's over. Right. So people are out on the streets, the, um, you know, life is back in the city, so there must be just so much more um, to that, you know, given, you know, your your sentence is kind of overlapped with this this pandemic, too. Um so it's it's a it's a fascinating you know I've never really thought about it actually until just now. Um, so what what's next? Do you do you have do you expect anything else from them? Are are they torturing you psychologically in other ways? Well, that's a great question. You know, I still have some legal issues that are out there that they have caused me, um, including they you know taken my money, they've taken my law license. Uh, we just filed a when motion. When you say taking your money, what does that mean for folks? Well, okay, so just the basics of the story are I was part of a legal team that won a $10 billion judgment against Chevron in the courts of Ecuador that's been validated by six appellate courts. Instead of paying that judgment in a country where they accepted jurisdiction, they sued me here for $60 billion, which is the most money anyone's ever been sued for. And they denied me a jury and they got a judge to let them present fake evidence from a paid witness that I supposedly committed fraud in Ecuador, which is false, been rejected by courts all over the place. But this judge ruled in their favor, this low level New York trial judge. And then after that, they got him to impose literally millions of dollars of court costs on me and ordered me to pay them for their own legal fees they used to persecute me through this fake evidence. So I'm basically have no money. I mean, they, they went into my bank accounts and wiped them out. My law firm account, my personal account. This happened two or three years ago. So that's why I have a defense fund, by the way, and why we need to raise money both to pay lawyers and to support me and my family. It's at freedonziger.com, by the way, if anyone wants to help. But that's really not the point. The point is, um, you know, there are things I'm dealing with, uh, you know, that need to be dealt with. And it's part of a corporate plan to silence me and others who do this work, you know, that is to try to hurt or ruin your reputation, take your money, um, you know, scare the heck out of you, induce you to jump off the roof of your building. And I mean that seriously. I don't think they would mind if I had done that. And ultimately, when all that doesn't work, I mean, they just had a corporate prosecution, the first in the country, and had me locked up for three years. Hmm. So I don't feel like I'm out of the woods by any means. Now, it so happens that right now, things are pretty quiet, but I'm, 
you know, I'm expecting um, them to possibly do something. Now, if they did do something more, I don't think it would serve their interests. But, you know, they're so they do things that I just astound me. Um, so we'll see how it plays out. You know, I'm happy. Uh, I have emerged from the experience much stronger than I was when I went into it, both as a person mm-hmm. and in terms of the support we have. We literally have 20,000 different people donated to my defense fund. We have a, an email list of 125,000 people now That's fantastic. Um, of supporters. And as you know, the 68 Nobel laureates have demanded my release. 120 environmental and human rights groups led by Amnesty International have sent a letter to President Biden demanding he pardon me. Um, 10 congresspersons just wrote the same letter to President Biden, including Jamie Raskin, Jim McGovern, AOC, Cori Bush, among others, um, it, Rashida Tlaib. It's been an amazing outpouring of support because people recognize how preposterous it is to lock up a human rights lawyer in the United States of America in retaliation for winning a pollution judgment against an oil company. It's just it's a, it's a violation of the law. In my view, it's it's it speaks very poorly of our country. And it's sort of a new step that we can't let become the new normal because the fossil fuel industry would love nothing more than for this to people just to sort of accept this as like the new way of going after people. Um, and we can't, we have to recognize that what happened to me, we can't let it happen to anyone else. And I'm, you know, working really hard as are my colleagues to build a campaign and ultimately a movement to make sure that it does not happen to anyone else. And that these major polluters and destroyers of the planet, you know, the oil, big oil companies are held accountable for their bad acts. So that's where I'm, my attention is now. By the way, I also plan to do some writing. I have a sub stack now. Um, I have two posts. I, I used to be a journalist. I don't know if you know that. I used to work for United Press International before I became a lawyer. I love writing and I'll do some writing and, you know, there's all sorts of opportunities out there to keep doing human rights work. And I plan on doing that as well. You know, you talk about building a movement and, and while I understand there's a lot of big corporate firms out there that have a lot of power, there are also probably millions of lawyers that around the country who do just decent work, who believe in, in the law, believe in this, whatever legal system we have as flawed and broken as it is, you know, you're not really going to get much better anywhere else. I assume um, I could be completely wrong about that. But, uh, you know, I, I, I would think that, you know, if this is a precedent, it really does endanger so many other lawyers around this country who, you know, lawyers who might even come from corporate firms who took on, you know, uh, uh, tobacco companies or or other, you know, you know, water uh, contamination cases, but also might represent, you know, a uh, developer or something. I think that you have lawyers who see this in their best interest to get behind you. Do you, do you are you seeing any of that happen? Has it, has it spilled over into the broader U.S. legal committee, community? That's a great question. You know, I'd like to see more support from my own community, honestly. Most of my support comes from the environmental community and, you know, you know human rights world, um, you know, Congress. Um, we need, you know, I think... Lawyers in New York, where I live, are very, very intimidated by the federal judiciary before which they practice. So they're nervous about standing by me because I'm really at odds with not just the two judges who did this to me. But, you know, the appellate court here in New York has never stopped this corporate prosecution. I mean, it's a real, I think, low mark for the federal judiciary in the United States and in New York, which enjoys, I think, undeservedly, the courts here enjoy like this great reputation around the world, New York federal courts. But the reality um, is, at least in my experience in this case, um, they have constantly abused their power to help Chevron really attack the people of Ecuador, not pay the judgment they owe. And really, in meta, the, my meta analysis is to attack the courts of a sovereign nation um, from the global South that had the temerity, the audacity, uh, the courage to actually do its job properly and hold a human rights violator accountable to its own, to the citizens of its own country that it harmed and even killed by dumping cancer causing toxic waste in the Amazon. And then on top of that, you know, the courts have let Chevron 
prosecute me directly. Never happened before corporate prosecution. I consider myself a corporate prisoner. I was for 993 days. The U.S. government, the federal prosecutor refused to do the case. Um, and, you know, I think Chevron and the industry as a whole believes this could be a new playbook um, to be used against those lawyers and others who are just a little bit too successful in their work. You know, I was successful. I helped my indigenous clients win a $10 billion judgment against a big oil company after the oil company polluted their lands and waterways. And by the way, it was based on voluminous scientific evidence that we generated in a trial, an eight-year trial. And the precedent of that terrifies not only Chevron, but the entire industry. So rather than address the poison that they caused in lands where people live and are dying, they decided to use me or try to use me as a weapon of mass distraction and target me. And they did it with 60 law firms and 2,000 lawyers. I mean, if they had just taken the fees they paid to all these law firms and invested it in remediating the pollution they deliberately caused, many, many lives would have been saved and the rule of law would have been in a lot stronger position. So I'm extremely disappointed in the in the judges here in New York for letting this happen. And, you know, I'll also say my conviction, so I should say so-called conviction, because I believe I've done nothing wrong and I've appealed it without a jury on these criminal contempt charges for which no one in American history has ever been charged with for doing what I did, which is appeal a civil discovery order. I mean, no one's, that's not a crime. And I was charged with a crime for engaging in the judicial review of an order that affected me. Um, it's just unbelievable that the courts are letting this judge, Judge Kaplan, you know, get away with this strategy and letting Chevron get away with a private prosecution. And we just need to be really vigilant. You know, this is how it starts, right? I mean, we saw this under the Trump presidency, you know, little by little, these norms or things we thought were norms get chipped away. And suddenly you wake up one day and like they're gone and we live in a different kind of society. I mean, you saw a lot of this in the, the leaked opinion from the Supreme Court on abortion. I mean, that opinion is, I, I read it, it's horrendous. I mean, it, it miscites authority, it miscites precedent. And there's a real effort by these right wing judges. In, in, you know, in that case, Samuel Alito, in my case, Lou Kaplan and Loretta Preska, you know, to become advocates. They're not judges. They're advocates trying to enforce, you know, a either a pro-corporate or almost like a theocratic agenda down the throats of the American people. And it's, it's you know, what, what Alito did on the abortion issue and what Kaplan did to me in the Chevron case are very connected. This is all part of the Federalist Society movement. Exactly. To corporatize and, and, and control our society in ways that serve corporate interests and serve, you know, right wing social interests, which, which, you know, I just believe it's all connected. I mean, you know, well, and that's where you think of the more um, you talk about building this movement out. I mean, you have a very strong movement right now. But uh, now that 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 you're you're out of the the, the I mean, you, you're able to go out. <laughs> Let's just start with that. You're able to meet people and and go and speak at different events. Um, there are so many folks. Whether you know Eric Holder and his his obsession with uh, you know legislatures and redistricting, and you know he's been on there all week talking about uh, the Federalist Society is you know money money laundering operation. I say that because they've really been moving money from all different places to get as many uh, right-wing uh, judges, you know, in place on, on all different courts. And they, you know, same thing with clerks. Uh, someone said, well, maybe one of the clerks leaked this. And I said, what, 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 what right-wing clerk would leak it? This is part of, they've been doing this for 20 years. They're grooming these clerks to be the next Supreme Court or other justices around the country. You'd think that those leaders in those movements would be willing to say, ah, here is an example of what happens when you go too far. And maybe they will. Maybe maybe they're just starting to see how bad it is yes. uh, because there's so many things happening at once. But have you seen any of that where folks in a, you know, beyond the activist space, beyond the left space and, you know, good government space um, are starting to see it, you know, more of the, the centrist stems, I guess I could say it. 
I, I think so. I mean, in my case, I the idea of a private corporate prosecution that deprives a lawyer of his liberty is something that is offensive to <clears throat> people, no matter what their politics. I found that. I, mean, I don't think this is a left or right issue at all. Um, I would argue, you know, that over the last 20 years, there's been a quiet coup that has taken place mm. in the country. You know, it's not a traditional coup where the military comes in at gunpoint and ousts a civilian elected leader. It's, it's a different kind of coup. It's subtle. And it's ultimately has taken control of, I would say, huge portions of our political system to serve corporate interests, be it the Congress, which is, you know, very tied into fossil fuel interests to the point where Joe Biden is appointing a fossil fuel lawyer who worked for Chevron to the federal bench. I mean, what's that all about? Jennifer Reardon, you know, and the executive branch, you know, 120 very prominent groups have asked Biden to pardon me. He doesn't even, he hasn't even responded, just ignored it. Um, and then, of course, now the judiciary, which used to be the last bastion of independent thought in our, in our governmental system, is now largely taken over by the Federalist Society. And, you know, Loretta Preska, who sentenced me, who locked me up for almost three years on a misdemeanor where the longest previous sentence was 90 days of home confinement. I served over 10 times that amount. She denied me a jury, wouldn't let me put on my defense. She read the newspaper during witness testimony. Um, what? And, yeah. And on top of that, she's a major leader of the Federalist Society. Well, yeah. Chevron is probably the Federalist Society's largest donor. Yeah. And it's just ridden with conflicts of interest. And these conflicts are flagrant. They don't care. They don't even care how they look. It's just a power game. Mm -hmm. And these forces, these interests have taken over so much of our government now, including the judiciary or parts of big parts of the judiciary that we, we live in a fundamentally different society than we did 20 years ago, in my opinion. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, if, if I think people, especially the last two weeks, this has become front and center. It's, it's hard to escape it. It's not an argument you're making anymore. It's not just low courts. It's, it's right there out in the open. Um, you're a 20 year slow clue. That's very well said. It's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 we're just, and you know, you know what, from their point of view, it's so clever because, you know, if they tried to stage a real coup out in the open, everyone would rebel and they wouldn't be successful. So they're staging a, you know, low level, little by little coup that over, you know, few people are even noticing and over a period of 20 plus years at the end, you're like, oh my God, things have actually fundamentally changed. That's what this was about. Mm -hmm. And the financing comes mostly from the fossil fuel industry. That is the Koch brothers funding network. That's Same right. crowd. And the money and in the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. They're like a unaccountable politi major political financing source in this country to control our society so that corporations can make even more money. I mean, that's really what their agenda is, in my opinion. And they've been making record profits uh, during the pandemic, and of course, with you know this this new conflict that's happening in Eastern Europe, um, there are opportunities for them to to price gouge and mm -hmm. really exploit people as much as possible. And not to mention the tech companies, which of course are are platforms that allow us to speak out. They have been limiting people's voices excessively, um, algorithmically, you know, with right wing uh, boosts and, and silencing of the left. So it's it's a very hard landscape to maneuver. And, and they're really trying, you know, every single corner of this country, they're trying to to take folks on like yourself who who have the courage to speak out. But while we have the, the time and the ability and the platforms, um, you know, it's important to to stay engaged in this fight. So so what do you expect? Um, what do you what can you say that you expect might happen next? You, you think they might have some trips. It's quiet right now, but there might be some other things uh, coming towards you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I, I whatever they want to throw at me, I'm prepared to deal with. Um, I don't think it's going to be in their interest to try to pile on at this point. I mean, I think they made their point. I just served almost three years in detention. Um, when I challenged uh, what I believe was an unlawful court order that I turned my computer over to Chevron, one that I had legitimately and ethically appealed. Um, 
So I believe my entire sentence was wrongful and unjust and unlawful. By the way, the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention agrees with me, and they've also ordered the U.S. government to compensate me. Hmm. This isn't just my opinion. Like, serious people who looked at this case say this case is a violation of international law, and I should be freed. Well, I'm now free because I was forced to serve my whole sentence anyway. Um, But... You know, the United States, the, 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 the case against Stephen Donziger and his detention, I think, will go down in history as a real low point for the U.S. federal judiciary. By the way, among many low points, right? I mean, we have a lot of issues in our judicial system that go way beyond Steve Donziger. And I'm kind of a minor player in that schematic. But I will say in terms of corporate accountability field, this has never happened before. So... You know, we need to understand how this happened, understand what happened, and understand how to prevent it from happening again. Stephen, I'm so glad we got to quickly catch up. Um, I hope to have you on again soon, have a longer conversation. It's, it's always just, you're so informative, you're so thoughtful, and so strong given everything you've gone through. And it's, it's wonderful that you're able to spend more time with your family now and go out and support uh, your son's basketball games and go out to eat at wonderful New York restaurants. <laughs> uh, but everybody who, who, who's been following Stephen's uh, case and, and things that have been, you know, the movement around him, make sure to go support him. We've got the link up there on the screen. Um, we've got it in, in all of the other I think that's my, platforms. I think that's my substack. That's I just started. Your substack. Yeah, so. It's, it's, we, will, we will list everything out below yeah. on all the different platforms. Thank you so much, Namiki, you. again, for being supportive and giving me the space to share my perspective. I really appreciate it. No, we we appreciate you. This is, trust me, this is an honor um, to be in your presence and to learn from you. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you. All right, we will be right back to talk about the nation on drugs. Is this a new thing or what, what are we talking about here? That's my teaser. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. The country has been at war uh, with drugs for as far back as, as I can remember and probably many generations can remember. Our next guest is the, he is a writer and the editor at The Nation. Uh, that is the magazine that we love to cover. Um, he was previously covered the 2016 election as the magazine's editor at large and for two decades before that was part of its London Bureau, The Nation on Drugs a fight that we have been fighting forever, the war on drugs. What is the state? What are the ramifications? What? H- how have Americans been affected? Uh, very excited to have Didi Guttenplan, who has COVID right now. So uh, thank you for joining us. I know that this has been a rough week, but it's you're doing a little bit better, right? I'm doing a lot better. I'm better than I sound. <laughs> okay, and, good. Uh, That's most important. I'm not contagious over the internet. So, <laughs> one thing I have learned during the pandemic is that you can't catch it over the internet. You can't catch it over the internet. There are a lot of things you can catch over the internet, but not COVID. Yeah, and so also, just to say, it's, it's a pleasure to be after Stephen Donziger, um, who, like you, we have covered, whose struggles we have supported. And it's great to see him out. So, yes, just yes, to say that. Been- Talk about, I mean, I'm glad that he linked it to the Federalist uh, Society because this is ultimately, we have to understand the connections between the the decades-long um, goals of the right wing and how it's affecting us today. And that includes, uh, you know, the, the, I don't even know how to say it, not just the war on drugs, but just every single aspect of what came about, um, whether it's the border uh, issues of the border or families that have been affected by the war on drugs um, or 
just the movement of drugs uh, across our borders, and of course, the imprisonment of folks who've been who've used drugs or dealt drugs. So, so what is this this nation on drugs? Um, what what is your goal with this? Well, a couple of things. First of all, America has been fighting a war on one form or another of intoxicants. I apologize; I have a cough drop in my cheek. If I look funny or more funny than usual, that's why. Uh, since Alexander Hamilton. Mm who started taxing whiskey producers in, in Western Pennsylvania in order to favor corporate whiskey producers. That was called the Whiskey Rebellion. So the government has been intervening in people's choice of intoxicants for a long time. But the reason we decided to do a special issue devoted to drugs is because in a way that conventional war on drugs, or at least against marijuana and psychedelics, seems in some ways to be ending. Hmm. But what's coming out of it is not a utopia where everybody grows their own, uses their own, turns on their neighbors, has a good time, manages their own risks. What's coming out of it is a co- another assertion of corporate power, monopoly power. And it was that intersection of the waning of the overt drug war and the transition to a kind of corporate patent war, corporate power grab, Wall Street power grab. That's where we felt the nation needed to jump in. And also, you know, we can get into this as much or as little as you like. For me, this is, as an aging boomer, something of a personal fight. Why is that? Well, because I used a lot of drugs. I mean, as I, as I, say, in the, <laughs> as I say in the editorial, I mean, my kids are all grown now, uh, but when they were small, you know, I dreaded them asking, well, what did you do when you were, you know, what did you do in the war on drugs, daddy? Because <laughs> the truthful answer would have been everything pretty much. Uh, you know, as I write in the nation, if you could sniff it, smoke it, snort it, uh, I probably did. And yet, you know, here I am, boringly respectable, uh, you know, the editor of a legacy media publication. Mm-hmm. And part of that is dumb luck. I have friends who died of AIDS because of infected needles. Uh, I have friends who, you know, became junkies and eventually died of that. Uh, neither of those things happened to me, but they might have. Mm-hmm. And uh, and also a white privilege. Right. Because, you know, as we write in the issue, the war on drugs was never an equal opportunity war. It was always aimed squarely and mainly at black America. And, you know, John Ehrlichman confessed this some 20 20 years after the fact, but it was always aimed squarely at black America and at the counterculture. Mm -hmm. And okay, you know, maybe I was a participant in the counterculture in my own small way, but, you know, the risks that I was running as someone who was using drugs, even occasionally dealing drugs, I think I'm past the statute of limitations on that. I meant to check, but if not, I'll take my chances. Um, You know, those were much smaller than if I were, you know, a black person in urban America at the time under federal, state and city surveillance and for whom the drug war was a tool in keeping communities controlled and contained. So you said that at the start that we've we've sort of, you know, transitioned away from um, the war on marijuana and psychedelics. Uh, marijuana in particular has been um, such a, a tool of going after black and brown communities. Does this mean that the right wing is not as interested in going after, at least from criminal justice perspective, black and brown communities? I mean, I live in New York and this is crime. This is the talk of the town right now because of our of our, our mayor. Um, and in a lot of cities around the country, you know, the right wing is pushing the crime narrative. But if... Marijuana is decriminalized in New York. Like, w- what's the vehicle now? Oh, well, that's not something else. But so I live in New York too, and in my part of Brooklyn, I don't, I don't know whether you've noticed this, you know, Mickey, but in my part of Brooklyn, there are all of these medical clinics that were set up, for example, on Court Street in Brooklyn Heights, mm-hmm. and now they're even though New York has not yet regulated the sale of marijuana, it's legalized or decriminalized, but not yet legal. Right. They've all dropped the pretense of being medical dispensaries and they're ready for retail customers. 
Now, I don't know whether they're serving retail customers yet, but they are ready. So I don't think, you know, I don't think that the Adams administration or any other administration is going to be able to roll that back. But does that mean that control of black and brown bodies has stopped right. being a government preoccupation? I wish it were so, but I don't think so. And that's why I make the point in my editorial and uh, Tavian Crossland, who's a young a young man who writes in this issue of his experiences as being a person who dealt weed and saw his fellow dealers of color sidelined by the wave of legalization. You know, these are people who have decades of experience. Right. And yet, you know, the all the legal entrepreneurs and legal outlets we see coming up are Wall Street funded and overwhelmingly white. So, you know, we, we feel that reparations ought to be an essential first part of any legalization. Um, do you see that happening anywhere in the country right now in, in, in terms of states that have legalized where there's a real fight or a movement that's making ways um, for reparations? Yes, there are states that have, have called for equitable, you know, equitable funding, equitable distribution, equitable licensing. I don't, I can't name them off the top of my head, but New York State is supposedly among them in terms of the legislation, but we haven't seen it yet. Right. And, you know, the devil's going to be in the details. Certainly New York has the chance to really, as it did during the New Deal days under Franklin Roosevelt, to be a real pioneer for justice here. To really say to people and communities, particularly who've been bearing the brunt of the drug war, we're not just going to get off your necks. We're going to help you repair the damage we did. Mm -hmm. So what other, means. what other aspects of society right now, um, you know, are, are affected or have been affected by these drug wars that if there is, you know, more and more decriminalization um, across the country, it, it could affect how those communities have been um, essentially, you know, uh, persecuted. Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot. I mean, the drug war was a real catch all for a whole bunch of bad things. You know, in addition to policing black and brown bodies, it also committed the U.S. to align with the most repressive regimes in Latin America. You know, it served as cover for intervention in, in countries that were daring to consider that maybe they would have a more redistributionist approach, you know, to economic justice. Right. Um, so there are lots of repercussions and lots of good things that come out could come out of stopping the drug war. But, you know, there's also a warning, and I, I sound that note in my editorial when I talk about Aldous Huxley and Soma, which is to say that, you know, in, in Huxley's novel, Brave New World, one of the things that enabled the kind of fascist takeover of the country, whatever country he was writing about, whatever fictional country, uh, was that the populace was so busy, you know, stoned on Soma that they were, they were too blissed out to resist. Right. You know, so I think as we see, for example, ketamine parlors springing up all across the South, which is one of the things that Zoe Cormier, who wrote our cover piece on Psychedelics, Inc., uh, and Aida Chavez, who wrote our piece, you know, on on uh, on mushrooms yeah. and psychedelics, uh, both of them talked about this wave of kind of privatization in which people are offered low cost ketamine treatment. But really what it means is just access to the drugs, not therapy, not a safe environment, not anything that's going to do you to anything except turn you into a reliable long-term consumer or what we used to call an addict. So you know, I think that's one of the things we have to be careful about. And it's one of the things that we hope and we would like to help push for, which is the leveraging of the legalization of particularly psychedelics, which have a long history of use, mm -hmm. both in black and brown communities and in indigenous communities, not just north of the border, but south of the border, but also in the counterculture to come up with alternative models of redistribution, of distribution, of, of production, of ownership. You know, there's a there's a lot of space here for potential innovation politically. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean like new shiny corporate logos. It means new ways of relating to each other, 
new ways of accessing these experiences that don't involve, you know, sh- signing up to shiny corporate brands. A hundred percent. And, and, you know, in, in a, in a use with caution or like a toolkit, how, how to use them responsibly? Because I mean, I'll speak from my own experience. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've mushrooms, for instance, uh, taking mushrooms with a guide is a very different experience than taking mushrooms out with your friends, <laughs> boating, for instance. I'll just leave that one there. <laughs> Didn't end well. I'll just say that. <laughs> was, was fun until we couldn't dock the boat. <laughs> Um, no, but I mean, for real, it can be very dangerous. You know, people have had bad trips, but there, there is a, there's a magical experience of when you're working with somebody and it can be profound and transformative and fun too. But, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, this is something that people have actually been talking about for a long time, you know, before he became his own wellness guru, uh, Andrew Weil, mm-hmm. uh, yes, was advocating for a different kind of drug education, which would be about safe use you know, teaching kids what's safe and what isn't, uh, you know, the differentiating between drugs that are designed to get you addicted as quickly as possible mm-hmm. uh, and those that are that are not between, you know, uh, natural, organically grown products that where you're the, produ- the production chain, where you have a relationship with the producer or the grower, where you know what you're getting. Um, and where there are members of your community. So they have a stake in making sure you have a safe experience. Right. right. You know, those are all things that we could be teaching kids in school in the same way that we teach about, you know, how to safely drive a car. And also, you know, it's, uh, it's not in the corporation's interest to do that, um, which is very dangerous. I think that if, if they're, if, if corporate interests are getting involved in the drug industry, especially psychedelics, um, it can absolutely affect somebody's life. I mean, it's not uh, smoking a little weed here and there is one thing, but you know, no, these are strong drugs. These, these, strong. Can, these can be life changing experiences in bad ways for people, particularly if they don't know what they're doing, they don't know what they're getting, and there isn't somebody responsible on hand to help if they need it. Right. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the nation, we did not say turn on, tune in, drop out on the cover of this issue. Um, you know, we talked about the transition from head, head shop to hedge fund as something that we should all be worried about. A hundred percent. Really fascinating. I, I know you're sick, so I don't want uh, <laughs> to exhaust you right now. And so you have a smooth recovery, but um, we'd love to have you back on. We can talk more about this and, and I'm sure we'll have some of uh, the writers um, at The Nation discuss their individual pieces because there's so much here. But folks, definitely go check it out. Uh, I think probably most of our audience cares about this issue if i'm going to be honest <laughs> well, it's good. you know you can you can check out the issue and other coverage of this issue on www.thenation.com and you know it's always a pleasure to talk to you thank take you care. so much don take care and feel better thank you All right, everybody, we have some shout outs uh, for today. Very excited. Gerard M., Louis P., and oh, thank you for joining us, patrons, and JH for increasing your pledge. So, so, so grateful. We have some replies to the Q&As. Oh, I don't know if everybody knows this, but we did some Q&As with our patrons. They, they sent me some Q&As, and I answered them. Um, and Patrick P. says my answer was perfect. Uh, specifically about you know involvement this year, I will be following your advice and organizing with my local DSA to register and mobilize voters for the midterms. So important right now. JH says I look forward to your post for us beautiful people. Oh, that's so sweet. You guys are beautiful. I really really enjoyed you and Emma from Majority Report the other day. Uh, the fellow running versus Bobert is perfectly awful. <laughs> As a gay man who went to Oregon. Um, BA in 92. Uh, I know some from Stanford. They're all Alex Walkers, gay, white, and 21. We love train wrecks, especially hyper-funded ones. And yes, class of 92, a little younger than Sam Cedar, but the same star sign Sagittarius. I'm cracking up right now. And yay for Jamie Peck being on last uh, recently. So JH is talking about this guy running against Bobert who um, is uh, from the LGBTQ community, but as a centrist and was really, really nasty against progressives. Really nasty. 
So we'll have to play that clip in the future. All right, who else do we have here? We have some super chats. Thank you so much. Before the cause, keep up the good work. To all involved with TNS, great job. Thank you to everybody else. We'll continue doing shout outs um, as regularly as possible. I know I'm sometimes slow at that, but I'm going to get better at it. I promise. And keep sending us your questions. We love these Q&As. We're going to do them more often. But in the meantime, if you are not already subscribing to us on podcast, we're available everywhere. All the different podcast places. And we're also on uh, Twitch. Join us at Twitch and YouTube. Make sure to like and subscribe and share on all the social media. Like us, follow us on social media. And finally, patrons, we love you so, so, so much. If you're not already a patron, go join us at patreon.com slash the Mickey show. And you can get a mug, a sticker, a bag, uh, lots of stuff coming our way. Make sure to join us at patreon.com slash the Mickey show. And we offer all sorts of deals. So if you are you were a patron and you had to drop off, let us know. Email us at the Nomi Show at gmail.com. We'll work something out with you. We've done in the past. If you want to sponsor a patron, let us know. That's paying it forward and super kind. Folks do that because our movement is so kind and you know, generous. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful Wednesday. We will see you on Friday for Femme Friday. In the meantime, stay in solidarity. Yeah. Uh-huh. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs stay fed. Deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The No Miki Show. Uh. The No Miki Show. Don't me.